al Dhahabi rahimahullah ta'ala introduces him in his chapter of Seer Alam al Nubula. He says, Al Imam al Qudwa al Qadi wa sahib Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Abu Darda, the Imam, the example, the judge, the Mufti of Damascus, the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now, what is his actual name? Abu Darda is not his actual name. His actual name is Uwaymir. Uwaymir. Okay, Uwaymir ibn Amir or Uwaymir ibn Zayd or Uwaymir ibn Malik. So there's some difference of opinion as to what his father's name was. However, he's from the tribe of Al Khazraj, the tribe of Al Khazraj. So the bigger of the two tribes of the Ansar of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, from Banu Al Harith, from the sub tribe of Al Harith. So it's a prominent uh, group of people amongst Al Khazraj. But Abu Darda ta'ala anhu is not a politician and he's not someone who gets involved in the conflicts that exist before. Rather, he's someone who shuns the conflicts, the internal disputes amongst the people of Yathrib at the time. So he's not someone who gets involved in many of the things that divided the Ansar at the time. Now, why is his name Abu Darda? I spent way too much time trying to figure that out and I still don't have an answer. Uh, some of the scholars said that he has a daughter named ad -Darda, A daughter named ad -Darda. And, you know, amongst the Arabs, obviously it's common that you're named the father of your son. Right? Amongst the Arabs, if the daughter, if a person only has, for example, a daughter, then that might be a reason why they'd be named the father of their daughter's name. Or if their daughter had a particular striking prominence or beauty or something that was extremely distinguishing. So some of the books say that he had a daughter named ad -Darda. So his wife also, by the way, is Umm ad uh, Some of the scholars say that Darda was a word that denotes hikmah, that denotes wisdom. So Abu Darda, he was called Abu Darda because he was the father or because he possessed some sort of great intellect. It seems to be the case that he actually has a daughter named ad -Darda, And uh, there is no way to say that for sure, to say for sure if that is indeed the case. Now, I'm going to say this from now so that you're not confused at the end. When you say Umm Darda, which is his wife, there are two Umm Dardas. There's Umm Darda al Kubra, the, the older one, literally, his first wife. And then at some point, she passes away, and the wife that he remarries is Umm Darda al Sughra, the younger Umm Darda. So what's his story and how does he come to Islam? Abu Darda was a man who was beloved to his people, who was non-confrontational, who was very wealthy. He owned multiple businesses around Yathrib. And generally speaking, you know, was someone that the people used to speak highly of. But again, someone who did not used to get involved in anything that was political at the time. So he avoided the Bu'ath Wars. He used to dress with the best of clothes. He was noted for his handsome appearance. And when Islam came, Abu Darda was not hostile to the Prophet ﷺ or to Islam in particular, but he was deeply devoted to his idol. So this is actually very interesting because when you talk about the Meccans and you talk about their idol worship, they were really insincere, right? They didn't really love their idols. They saw their idols as a utility to power. And they were pretty unapologetic about that when they were sitting together. The only reason they honored these idols was because these idols gave them access to power and prominence in Mecca at the time. It's very rare that you find a sincere abid, a sincere worshiper of the idols. Abu Darda actually fits that category. So Uwaymir ibn Malik has his own idol at home. He used to be extravagant in adorning that idol. So he would actually dress that idol with the best of what he had in terms of garments and cloths. He would perfume that idol with the most expensive of perfume. And he would devote himself to that idol for a very long time. So the ulama say there's already something very different about him, that he actually seems to be a devoted worshiper of his idol, which is not the case for most people. In fact, rarely do you find that uh, in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ with some of those companions. So what ends up happening is his best friend converts to Islam early on. And his best friend is a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Rawaha. Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu ta'ala anhu. 
And I'm going to do an episode on him later on, inshallah ta'ala. So I'm just going to introduce him briefly here in the context of Abu Darda. This is his best friend. And they were closer than blood brothers. They used to live with one another at times, travel with one another. Uh, they used to share from each other's wealth. And Abdullah ibn Rawaha was one of the very first people to embrace Islam from Medina. So he actually was from those who went to Al-Aqaba and took the pledge with the Prophet Now when he comes back to Abu Darda and he tells him about what happened, Abu Darda's reaction is, good for you, but I'm happy with my religion. Like I'm not interested, it's okay for you to be that way, but I'm happy with my idol and I'm going to stick to my idol and I'm gonna stick to my business and I'm gonna kind of ignore this whole religion business. You know, the attitude is sort of like Muhammad وسلم, seems like a nice man. I'm happy that you found something meaningful. I'm okay, you go your way. And SubhanAllah, they say that Abu Darda anhu, even supported Abdullah ibn Rawaha in his being Muslim. And when he went to Badr, so he missed Badr, Abu Darda missed Badr. Abu Darda, out of concern for Abdullah ibn Rawaha, went out and started asking the Sahaba as they were coming back if Abdullah ibn Rawaha was okay. So he's even checking up on him. So they are extremely tight. Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala anhu, still not a Muslim. And Abdullah ibn Rawaha is losing patience. Why? Because Abu Darda is basically going to become the last of the Ansar, the last of the major Ansar to convert to Islam. That's not an exaggeration, subhanAllah. The last Ansari, prominent Ansari, to accept Islam is actually Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Abdullah ibn Rawaha is like, look, this is getting out of hand. I've waited for you. You're my brother. I went to Badr. He's still not Muslim. He's busy with his businesses. He's got his money here or there. All he's doing is he's you know, coming home and he's spending time in, 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 in worshiping this idol. So one day, Abdullah ibn Rawaha goes to his house, he goes to Abu Darda's house, knocks on the door. Umm Darda answers the door. He says, is Abu Darda home? She says, no, actually he's out working in his business. Abdullah says, can I come in? She said, sure, come on in. He goes to the idol and he starts breaking the idol. And he says, Ala kullu ma yud'a ma Allahi He said, everything that's called upon besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is falsehood. And Umar Darda is screaming at him, what are you doing? He breaks the idol and he says, bye, and he leaves the house. Please do not go into your friends' homes and like break crosses and stuff like that. All right, this is a relationship. Abdullah ibn Rawaha knew how to test it a bit at this point. He's at a particular point with Abu Darda. He said, I'm gonna go to his house and just do this and let's see what happens. So Abu Darda comes home and Umar Darda is crying in front of this broken idol. And he goes, what happened? She says, your brother Abdullah ibn Rawaha came. He shattered the idol and then he just left. And so Abu Darda starts talking to the idol and he says, Wayhak, Hallam Tanata, Ala Dafata and Nafsik. Woe to you, why didn't you stop him from breaking you? Couldn't you defend yourself? And Umar Darda says to him, Lokana Yanfaru, O Yatfaru an Ahad, Dafa an Nafsihi wa Nafa'aha. If he could protect anybody or benefit anyone, he would have done that to himself. He would have protected himself and he would have benefited himself. So Abu Darda goes, أَعِدِّي لِي مَاءً فِي الْمُخْتَصَرِ said, you know, can you get some water and put it in the bathtub? And he goes and he does ghusl, he takes a shower, he wears his best clothes, لَبِسَ حُلَّتَهُ ثُمَّ ذَهَبَ إِلَى النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, And then he goes to the Prophet وسلم, to become Muslim. Now it's really funny here, subhanAllah, because when he went to the Prophet وسلم, the Prophet وسلم was sitting with Abdullah ibn Rawaha. So Abdullah ibn Rawaha saw him coming and Abdullah ibn Rawaha said, Ya Rasulullah, hadha Abu Darda wa ma urahu illa jaa fi talabina. Ya Rasulullah, this is Abu Darda and I think he's coming to get us. I think he's coming after me. I think he's really upset about what I did. I did something to his idol and he's coming to get me basically. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, inna ma jaa li yuslim, he's coming to become Muslim. Inna rabbi wa'adani bi Abu Darda an yuslim. Verily, my Lord promised me that Abu Darda was going to become a Muslim. So this was a special promise that Allah gave to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that this beautiful man with good character is one day going to become Muslim. Now, by the way, 
Abu Darda used to laugh about his idol worship with Abdullah ibn Rawaha later on. But in the moment, that was a pretty risky move. And subhanAllah, he used, to, he used to reflect. I mean, how is it that we actually used to devote ourselves to this? And subhanAllah, it, it's something that really makes you think that sometimes the brightest and the best can be carried away in these ways and you shouldn't make assumptions. And there's hikmah to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, not to curse and not to insult their gods because then they'll curse and insult your gods. Give it a chance, give him some time. And he opened up to the idea and he came to embrace Islam with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he is considered the last of the Ansar, the last major Ansari figure to embrace Islam. But what ends up happening with him is that he ends up somehow surpassing all of the Ansar in knowledge, which is really interesting about him radiallahu ta'ala anhu because he missed out on some critical time with the Prophet But his embracing Islam was so sincere that you immediately saw the impact on him. So he missed Badr. But then when it came to Uhud, they said at Uhud that there were only a handful of people that stayed around the Prophet right? I mean, most people fled the Battle of Uhud at the end because they thought that, first they thought the Prophet was dead. And then when the army attacked from behind, most people just instinctively ran from the battlefield. There were a few of the Ansar and a few of the Muhajireen that stayed around the Prophet Abu Darda anhu, was one of those people that stayed close to the Prophet وسلم, in the battle of Uhud. And the image of him is that he used his sword and then he ran, he, he dropped his sword. He didn't have a sword anymore. Then he picked up arrows and he threw arrows. And then when he ran out of arrows, he picked up stones and he threw stones. Anything that he could find to fight, he kept on going with the Prophet ﷺ and trying to fight off the people from killing the Prophet ﷺ, risking his life and suffered multiple wounds in that process. And the Prophet ﷺ looked at him and said, who is that? And they said, that's Abu Darda. Rasulullah ﷺ said, Ni'm al-Farisu Uwaymir. Ni'm al-Farisu Uwaymir. So the Prophet ﷺ praised him. What, what, what a great warrior. Uwaymir is. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Hakim wa ummati Uwaymir. In one narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, The wise man of my ummah is Uwaymir Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala anhu.